an equal and quality education for our children. Our first speaker is actually a person who needs no introductions because she is well known in our community and a long time community service member here in Basketball in Please welcome Sister Amina Abdullah as she remembers Sister Claire Mahan. Anyway, um, Sister Marie 
Joshua. They called her Baby G at the time. Uh, her aunt, her name was Jessie, and she lived in Chicago. You know, she lived in New York, excuse me. But she had two daughters. One was Minnie, one was Nothing. Nothing actually was the secretary to an honorable really life behind So she lived in the house. So she told us, uh, she told us to just come over to the house. She said, come and knock on the back door. And because uh, they were going to see a play called, called The White Man's Heaven is a Black Man's Hell. So uh, we got on the hell at the time, just me and her. And that was at the time when we were supposed to be out of dark. And it was just getting to be dark when we showed up at the back of the world we like my aunt's house. We were knocking on the door, and so the sisters who were in the kitchen, they came and they wanted to know, well, you know, who are you guys, and why are you here? Anyway, Novene came down and, um, uh, you know, told them why we were there, and so that was exciting for me because I was a, you know, young teenager, and we actually got to go with the Honorable Life Mahana and Sister Clara uh, to a theater, and the uh, white man's heaven was a black man's hell was playing, and you know, at that time, Louis X was the star of that particular uh, presentation. So, um, I'm just grateful and thankful to my parents who uh, started off in the Nation of Islam and uh, got me going on my life here, and it's like amazing, I'm still here. I said, all praise is due to Allah, and that's the only thing I can say, it's all praise is due to Allah. So thanks for listening to me, and we will now turn it over to, uh, we're gonna have a, a poem selection by our brother, uh, Her courage, her conviction with a heart of gold, 
how can we sit around and not make sure that her story is told? It's in her spirit that we will continue to build institutions and of learning because that was her field. It's in her spirit that we have leadership we have today with a legacy of vision that no one can take away. In her spirit, our soul should be yearning to go out and establish great institutions of learning. It is in her spirit that we are in the best situation. And let me make it clear with a clear-cut understanding of W.B. Muhammad's Tafsir, all because it is in her spirit, with God's help, we have been blessed with Sister Claire Muhammad, a woman with a heart of gold. Dear believers, let us make sure that her story is told. Peace <coughs> be upon you. Assalamualaikum. <laughs> Jackson. I've been to all these places and I will continue to go and meet with the Muslims 
throughout the community to find out how they're, how they're doing. And see if we can uh, bond our networks and work together and cooperate. I want to begin by saying, uh, uh, Sister Claire Muhammad, I think it's important for me to emphasize this because we live in an environment where our perception is messed up. We don't, in the world, we don't even know how to perceive uh, family anymore, husband and wife, roles. Uh, so by not having the proper perception of families, we end up accepting anything. We see a pervasion of women who want to be men, and we see men now, especially, who want to be women, and they're force-feeding us to accept this as a way of life, as a way of life. One of the things that they have done very cleverly is taking the emphasis off of motherhood, like it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter. And I hear men saying, a woman can't raise a man. <laughs> yeah, I hear them say that. A lot of single mothers are messing up and they say they can't raise a man. You see? That's what they say about women. And then they make the woman look and say, oh, they're not letting you in the pool pit to speak, to be a preacher. Y'all, oh, hey, that's holding women back. You know, why are they look? Well, dear brothers and sisters, this is what I'm doing. This, this talk that I'm giving, yeah, I inspire people. Maybe we get lifted, we get emotional. But it does not compare to the work that you are doing. There's no way. Raising the children, teaching them, and doing the things in the home. Don't let them fool you and think that this is all, and just standing up and doing this. No, it takes away from what a motherhood is. When you look at Sister Clay Muhammad, first and foremost, that period that she was in, most of the sisters were dedicated to helping white people. They were working for white people. Taking care of their children, ironing with them, washing, and their children in some cases were being neglected because they were doing that work for them. Sister Claire Muhammad worked for us. Sister Claire Muhammad taught our leader, Imam Ray Warbi Muhammad. He did not see like Muhammad when he was about 13 years old. Because they got away like Muhammad was right, he was in prison, he was running, people were after him, they were trying to kill him. And Elijah couldn't be home that much. So the one who taught him was Sister Clara Muhammad. Right. Imam Muhammad was a good cook, too. He made uh, egg made sausage. You know? He would get in that kitchen and he would cook up some stuff. And when he got that egg made sausage together, man, it was sharp. I mean, I want some now. It was that good. But he would sit in the kitchen with Sister Claire Muhammad while she was cooking, and the people would come in there and say, uh, Sister Claire, why don't you get that boy out of here? You know, he in the way. She said, leave him alone. Leave him alone. And they left him alone. 13 years it was with him, and he stood and said, I am still obeying my mama. 50, 60 years old. I am still obeying my mama. She said, boy, I beat you in another spirit. <laughs> Sister Claire Muhammad. Sisters, I'm sharing with you something very important. Because Allah gave us a sign in you. He gave us a sign. And that sign is he's given life to you. You're responsible for the life, for the future. He's given that over to you. And Sister Claire Muhammad was given the life for us, the responsibility for that life. And she knew what to do with it. Imam Muhammad said one day he had a newspaper and had a white man, and she took it and tore it in front of him and said, look at that, now you tear it. That's the devil, don't be scared of it. Imam Muhammad learned not to fear. Now he didn't grow up to say, all oh, right, folks, this will talk down there. But he, he stood as a man not fearing or growing up the way some of us grew up. My mom and dad, when the white man come to the door, they would change. I know they didn't understand. I would get my mom and her they come there, and she'd be saying stuff that don't even go together, but trying to impress him. And I wonder, what is it with mama? 
Why she change when they come in? What's going on? Teaching me that they deserve a better respect for me to change. But your leader didn't, didn't come up under that. Didn't come up under a white Jesus. Or that white people were superior. Or that our only hope is with them. And Sister Claire Muhammad wouldn't let him go to the schools and be indoctrinated the way we do it with our children. Especially here in Detroit. I went to the school, the public schools in Detroit. The only African American I learned, and this is terrible, the only um, African American that I saw in the books was Sambo. He wore jeans, torn, and he would wander in and out. Now, Tom and Dick and Spot and him, they had a family with a beautiful fence and all that. But Sambo had nobody. And I'm looking at that. You know how important it is for a child to have an image of himself so in something? But this is what the public schools was doing to us. So she would not let her son go and be indoctrinated by that voice. Am I saying close the public schools because they no? In some cases, you gotta work with them, you gotta supplement the education. You have to have your own independent effort, but you cannot abandon the public schools. So that's something we can walk into gun. That's what I'm saying. So we should have a program that will supplement the education that they have. We'll talk more about that as we go forward. So they have diminished the role of mother. You see? Now let me say this. I'm going to read a little bit from a lecture that Imam Muhammad gave. And the lecture is called Mother and Daughter. And he gave it in 1977. You can get the tape, you can order it. You get the Muslim Journal, you should read this. You should, you should get it. I have a copy for one of the sisters I'm gonna give it to her, but I intend to get it. But it was just released by his son recently. And I read it, I, I listened to the Imam's lecture, and it's really gonna give you a perception of what family is, what husband and wife is, what our roles are. The way the city is planned by men, it retards the life instead of freeing the life. They go back to the womb. What happens to, because they build a society the way that we build it, under their influence, they have a tendency to go back to the womb. Now, the Imam in that lecture quoted a book and the name of that book is The Infilization Man-Child, The Infilization of Man. Now, if I hear the imam say it, I do research, I go away research. I, it's only one book that he mentioned that I've not been able to get. And that's the book in there where he said, a German wrote it and said, the German wrote it, and it says that a people who were in darkness uh, found the light. I think that's the name of it. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. I've not been able to locate that one book. But all the other books I've been able to locate. So when I'm telling you something, you should have a pencil to do further research on it. But in that book, they did a study some years ago. Now, this is 1977. They did a study on man and how he reversed back to being a child. And how over the years, societies like Rome and Greece Men revert back to homosexualism. And how they become so, uh, and he says that in that book, it says that they, they hate what they've done. They look at society and they try to revert back. And the only way they know where to go is back into the womb. So they start acting like children. Some of them even wear diapers. You know that, don't you? Some of them say, hey, beat me, beat me, dominate me. I've been bad. These are men who are leading. Who are leading? Some of them become so feminine and childlike. You know, that must have been the situation when Mary, uh, God, uh, Mary in the Quran, the mother of Jesus, that must have been a situation in her, in her lifetime that men were so messed up that God chose a woman without the aid of a man because they were in bad shape. And if you go to Hajj, and I've been there twice. We have to put on the ephron. The man has a, a, a two-piece white, white piece on, nothing under it. It's like a sheet, two sheets that you got wrapped around you. You're in them for about three or four days or a week. 
And I mean, you're grabbing this, you're trying to have this, you got pins, you got all kinds of stuff trying to keep it up so it don't fall. It reminds you of a diaper. That would remind you of it. The sisters walk around, that girl walks around now with these stuff on. Well, why the man is reduced to this? Well, Imam Muhammad say, Allah is trying to correct the problem that exists in the world. What is that problem? That men say women are the reason that this world is in the mess that it's in. That the woman becoming 18, which is three sixes, equal to devil or Satan. And that they entice Adam to bite the apple and messed up everything. And that the woman is the wicked creature that got us in this mess. Allah says in, in Islam, no, man, you put on a diet. You the problem. You, you, you done messed it up. Hey, you need to get it right. This is what Allah says. And it's saying to us, we need to get it right. So let us go. They go back to the womb. I Imam point out, may point out in this book, that they even wrote music that had that beat, you know, the beat. Boom, 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 boom. And it's the same beat that beats in the womb. The heart that they hear in the womb. So they kind of crawl back, you see. God has entrusted women with the light of the world. Mothers came from an ancient belief. Mother, the name mother, where does that name come from? Imam Muhammad asked the question, where does this name mother come from? Well, Mut was the ancient that they used for earth. Mut, M-U-T-T, or Muta, M-U-T-E-R, which means earth. Mother was the earth. So that's what the ancient people said. So they looked at the earth and they said, okay, earth gives life. It nurtures, it, it allows things to grow, so they named mother after that. So the Greek became to be mother that were really the earth, because the mother sustained life, the earth burst life and sustained life, gives it food and nourishment. Isn't that what mother does? Life starts with the mother. The evolution of the image of the woman in religion from Buddha, which is earth, which is mother, and eventually came to, God directed the ancient people to the right source for their research. So don't think the ancient people are stupid when you're doing your research. Some of them had better sense than we have today. And I'll just take you back to the South. Before we had the internet, the TV, and the telephone, and all this other stuff, people in the South used to see each other and say, you know, sister so-and-so, you know, I've been missing you. She said, I've been feeling you. You used to conceal one another. Because we weren't preoccupied with all this mess. So their souls were more open. They were more spiritual. They were more innocent. So they were open to these messages and these signs better than, than we are today. So the ancient people were the same way. So God directed them to the right source for their research. And what is the best source for their research? The natural creation. You will see the signs of God. Earth was a sign for the woman for a long time until man decided that the earth was no more a good sign or, or an image for the woman. Then he made air a sign or image for the woman. Now we get to air. Now why is air? And it says, uh, the air began to help me when it said, Hawa, E, Hawa. The air about the earth. As man progressed, he began to realize that the strongest influence in his life was a woman. I remember as a young kid, man, uh, taking a little karate, <laughs> you know, down with a bunch of guys. But man, women were around. I'm doing kicks I wasn't supposed to do. <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, it's this natural me trying to do that. <laughs> So I'm trying to do kicks and stuff and everything that I cannot do, but I'm trying to impress this woman. Okay. Brothers and sisters, grass wouldn't be as good as it looks if it had not been for a woman. Men wouldn't care about no grass. You wouldn't very care about planting no flowers and looking and looking nice. It's because we influenced by you. I was at a meeting uh, recently, and they're trying to get us to accept this uh, LGBT thing is like, and they begin to outline to me the terrible rate of suicide among homosexuals and lesbians. The loneliness, 
the isolation, the withdrawal, the problems that they are experiencing. And I told them at the meeting, I said, well, you know, I'm not like everybody else. I kind of think out of the box. I said, I'm willing to take the criticism, especially when it comes to saving people's lives. Now, I'm married. And I told them that everything that God gives us, he allows it to grow. I say emotionally, I have not matured without the aid of a woman, my wife. That's how I grow. You want to know why the priests are having the problems that they have? They're not mature. They're not emotionally mature. So it's through a woman that I grow. That's why the Bible says, I give you the woman as a help meet, not M-E-A-T, M-E-E-T, to help you meet the destiny that God intended for you. So I gave you the woman, you see, as a help meet. And so I told them that, oh yes, I said, so I, I had to say this because I had to give them the good news that if you want emotional stability and if you want to achieve emotional adulthood, then you need a woman. Allah says in the Quran, I didn't miss you anymore. If I miss you, I miss you. Get a wife. And it goes back to, it goes back to the invisible man. Where the brother said, somehow I got disconnected from my social responsibility. That's why marriage is half of your religion. Because it, it means social responsibility. Oh, so the air above the earth, as man progressed, he began to realize that the strongest influence in his life was a woman. I didn't have nothing. I had a job. I had a four-four bedroom apartment. I had a mattress in one room. And I was broke. <laughs> I'm married, got a family, I got a farm. <laughs> the appeal of the woman. The base of society is motherhood. And if that base is weakened, there is no hope for man. Elijah Muhammad, may Allah forgive him his faults and grant him grant his faith. Now, Sister Claire Muhammad said of Elijah Muhammad that he was drunk, drinking. And he was drinking because he could not face, that he could not provide adequately for his family. And I can sense that, I can feel that. Looking at my daughters and my family not being warm, not being properly fed, I can close them the way they want. It, it does something to you. So, so he reverted to drinking. And she would tell the honor Elijah Muhammad, well, honey, they got some aid. Let's go downtown and sign up for these handouts that they have. No, he couldn't do it. He just, his, 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 he was the seed of the coming tree. And in his nature, he couldn't do it to stoop that low, to ask for handouts. So he would go and drink, and she would have to go get him and carry him on his back. Carry her on his back. And then one day she heard that this man, Barack Muhammad, was teaching. And she took the honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now they got this movie out of Selma, right? I don't care what movie you make, none of them contribute more to the civil rights movement than what I'm telling you right now. None of them will contribute to the civil rights movement, the story that I'm telling you right now. And she took him, and he gave his last dime to that man, and he followed him. And here we are today, in Detroit, Michigan. Donald B. Elijah Muhammad said, where there is no decent women, there can be no decent men. Sisters, you have to live for us. Imam Muhammad said, not behind us, but ahead of us. You have to lead us down the path of life. Man is never strong enough to, to hold up the dignity of womanhood or motherhood. Only a woman can hold up the dignity of motherhood. Now how important is motherhood? Motherhood was the first one to say, boy, don't touch that fire. Boy, don't do that. You better act right. They gave us manners and respect. You don't need that. The president needs that. I don't care where you go, you always need mom. My mom is still with me. My grandmother. 
Now, when you think about homosexualism or lesbianism, just think about grandma. What happened? Where's grandma in that picture? Huh? And my grandmama was awesome. That's why I got my faith. She was a Christian. But she had a granddad that was a pistol. Grandma would say, I just wait on the Lord. And she was a decent, moral woman. She was like Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in that she was innocent and morally upright. I cannot uh, even think of the idea that this woman did something that was immoral or wrong. Lied or cheated or stole. My, my brother, she didn't do that to me. He know. We know. That's my grandmother, and I'm pretty sure you had somebody in your family that's the same way. Man was not made up to hold it up, hold it up. He was made to seize it, capture it, and to use the man go away. But the woman was made to discipline the man by reminding him that you are his mother. Tell him to clean up your mind and get yourself straight. We need a mother when we are born. We need a mother when we need a house to go to the streets. And we need a mother when we get into the White House to rule the nation. We need a mother. It should cover the whole world. Women have to stay on the case. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not learning to you what is plaguing or what is holding back this thing in America. It started at home. If we're going to arrest our children drifting and choosing this crazy life as a way, it starts with the mother. You have to make sure in the home is going on. Now, you know what this thing I'm doing up here talking all these movies, get spiritual and all that other good stuff, but the nuts and bolts of what goes on is what you have to do. The, pre the biggest problem we have in life is the absence of motherhood in life. Now, we're going to make that. Women cannot wait for man to teach you the religion or how to be a Muslim. They need you to teach them something. You have to stand up and do your part. You think a lecture is it? Another term for woman is help me to come together. We have to trust God and trust him in all the way. Ask him for guidance and then trust him. He said, I've given you as a help me. And we'll talk about the Quran in a little bit about what it says about women. We know we are drawn together. But on a higher plane, we are drawn together because we want to make, have children. But on a higher plane, and some men never reach that point where they graduate and see the, value, the other value that women have or what we've been talking about, I, 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 opposed to her, uh, the uh, physical part. And we talked a little bit about the emotional part, which is very important. He made the woman a kind of influence that's driving him to his goal in life. God wants him to reach his goals. And that goal is to improve upon life, to build a society better and better, and never give up trying to make it better. That's why the brother in Invisible Man, somehow I got disconnected from my social responsibility because I am not building life for me. I am not responsible for my own future. I am in a man mode and I'm looking out this gutter and I don't see me responsible for even my own life. Somehow, I got disconnected from my social responsibility. Another word is I just got disconnected from being responsible for community life. He must never give up on trying to improve his world. Who is the driving force for that man? The woman. Now we come to the Holy Quran. Civilization has taught men that he has to have a woman to quiet him. I had this discussion with my wife and daughter down here. I get them to hear the tape. And I said, you know, a woman, <laughs> you know, I can get a baby and it'd be all problem, but a woman can get that baby and that baby to rest. To go to sleep. There's some men. A man, he be there talking and trying to do it. He just can't do it. He wonder, why did she come here and do that? Allah says in the Quran that he made a woman as a comforter. He made a woman as a comforter to put at rest. He said he, need, he needs a woman to rest his life. Men become too excited. The child forces take over sometimes. 
He get up with it. He want this. He want that. He want to move with this. He wants to do all of that. Mama come along. I don't think that we should trust that. She like the heart. You know, that suggests things to the brain. Sometimes, you know, the heart is kind of quiet when it does. It don't do it all boastfully, boastfully like, you know. It just comes. Yeah. What the battery? <laughs> wow. Hey, what time am I supposed to stop? Anyway, this I got a copy. I'm, I'm copying too, so I need a copy. Oh, I got another car in this black bag. But you don't have to put it in there. Okay. So Allah says in the Quran that they are rest. I'm glad I got I'm glad I got my daughter working with me. Inshallah. We'll accomplish some more. So that's motherhood. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to stop there on, on motherhood. And I, I want to say this, this is important. We already discussed that. We talked about Sister Claire Muhammad and her importance. And we talked about renewing the world and talking about changing our perception of motherhood and its importance. I, on a personal level, have benefited a great deal. And I, 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 the reason I'm standing here now and I, I'm talking about the subject is because my life has been one of getting support from women. So much. Um, I was, uh, I'll share this with you because it's a personal you know. I was, uh, went for a job. I always couldn't get a job in Detroit because I had such a large family, plus my mama taught me to work. And my mama, when I started working at eight years old, my mama would take half of what I made. Why cry? You know. But after a while, I got used to it. And you know what? Now, you know, I thought about that. Out of all those years that I did my job, I never went home. I couldn't come home and say, Mama only made $7. I never did. You know what I did? Whatever I made, I told her that's what I made, and she would take half. I thought about that. I said, Doctor, how do you know? I just, whatever I made, I just told Mama I could have held back. But I never did that. Now, I made money. Shiny shoes on tire and box wood at the car box where the blue note bar is. That's the job I had, shiny shoes out there. I made money. Then they, the, the lady, the black owners who owned the car wash, and a lot of them had a shoe shine like me so well, they graduated, they graduated me into the car wash and gave me a job. So I was making $13 a day and went home. Mama took half. You see? Mama took half. So when I left home, the first thing I did, and they ain't never looked back, the first thing I do is pay rent. I ain't never been put out. You know, my black men can't say that. They ride good, they pay rent. <laughs> Don't have their priorities right. But I know to pay rent first. <laughs> you know, and I did. And I, I learned that from my mother. So I could always get a job, and I work for African Americans. So I, so I didn't find an idea that they can't own, they can't do stuff that's not fair, they're not right. Because I learned that right here working for African Americans. Then I went to a nursing home and got a job. And the way I got that was I went to the office of unemployment was over there by a white record shop. It used to be a Providence Hospital over there too, a nursing home, that's where I worked at. I went to the job place and I said, yeah, I need a job. And she said, well, what you think about doing? I said, well, I want to be an RN. And the lady said, oh, okay, wait a minute, that's a nursing home right over here, let me call over there. And she called over there and the lady was there, her name was Miss Springs, she sent me right over. She wanted to talk to you. Miss Springs said, look, uh, Celine, after she talked to her, I told her I had aspirations, I want to be an RN, and I want to work in this capacity, you know. She said, well, look, I'm going to try something new with you, never been done. I said, what is that? She said, instead of me making you an orderly, I'm going to make you a nurse's aide. And I said, oh, she said, go down there, downtown, get your food handler's car, get all that, come back. I got a white suit there, have a little white out of bed, and I came and I worked. Got, I got put me in a situation where now I'm taking care of geriatric, so I'm learning wisdom from all people. You see, I'm, I'm absorbing from them. I'm learning from them. They come from many different fields. Many of them are abandoned by their families. They don't even see it. So I'm not only doing my nurses work for them, but I'm doing stuff by like going to the drugstore, going to the bank, and doing extra stuff for them. They love me. They love me. They couldn't wait for me to come to work. They used to call me Miss Van. That was my name before I changed it. And I would do all this extra stuff for them. And I'd be the only male employee there on second shift. So all of the women working. Can you imagine this? All these women are working there. And I'm the only male, and a woman hired me. Then when we got so comfortable with me, brother, I'm telling you, I'm sitting in the bathroom, and I'm hearing them talking about their boyfriends and all that other stuff. I 
I said, you know what, you know what it did for me? I said, I'm not going to mess with any of these women. <laughs> you know, because I mean, they talk about their boyfriend and what they ain't doing. You know, and they got real private with me. They got so they didn't, you know, they didn't care if I was a man. So I, so right then and there, I, I established a principle without me knowing. Don't get involved. Don't do it at work. You know, be respectful of men, of women. And that's what I did. I worked there, we got along together, they got so comfortable with me that they And when Miss Spring got another job at a high position at Boston Hospital, how many of you know Boston Hospital? Raise your hand. You don't remember Boston Hospital? It used to be owned by African Americans on Boston, off the desk. It was doc, it was a it was a black African American family, a daughter and two sons, two doctors and a dirt, and a, the, the, the sister of them lived right there in the hospital. She got an administrative job over there, and the first person she called was me. Now this is a woman. I have to share, I have to share those with you. And I can go on and on and on down my career what has happened to me. Because of women. Now, I shared a little of my personal experience, but there are many other experiences that I can share. And I think I will. One other, this is a young sister who got hired at General Motors. Now, I'm 30, 40 years in General Motors. And they hired a sister from Flint. And uh, she was a maintenance supervisor, the first African-American sister maintenance supervisor. Now, I'm going to be all right. I'm still trained. I got a radio. You call me if there's a heater problem, something broke down. She calls me. The client will call her, tell her where it is, then she'll call me over the radio. She says, Salim Manan, Salim Manan, do you copy? I say, yes, ma'am, I copy. She said, we got a problem on B6497 with the heater system. I say, yes, ma'am, I go out. I go out, check it, fix it, then I radio back. I said, Janine Blake, Janine Blake, do you copy? I said, I'm on, D I'm on D7 heater, and I've adjusted the flame on there, and everything is fine. She said, thank you. Do you see what I'm doing? Caucasians in the plant, they listen to the radio. I made up my mind that I'm going to give her respect. And I said, yes, ma'am. Now, she's older than me, but I'm saying yes, ma'am, to her. And because I did that, we developed a relationship. Now, they got to cover down. Now, she went on, and now she's working in Chrysler somewhere in this area as a maintenance supervisor. Now, you know what a maintenance supervisor is. This is Janine Blake from uh, Flint. This is a woman. Brothers and sisters, let me, let me move on and say this to you. In the Bible, God says, when I found you, you were wallowing in your own blood. Imam Muhammad says it means the blood from the birth, the blood of the woman that bore them, if, there, if, if there's a mother. The Jews, learned teachers, and the rabbis, they understand what this means. They understand it clearly. It means he found them socially confused, socially corrupt, and without the spirit of social community. That's what they found. And I guess the, it's related to out of slavery when the Honorable Frederick Douglass came on the scene. I guess he found us wallowing in our own blood. And it also comes to mind when you look at Detroit and how the African American leadership is so corrupt. Now it's happening all over the nation, but Detroit is like the Mecca of African Americans who have been in leadership and be corrupt. It's like the Detroit Free Press would have an article every week of some brother that's been given a prestigious position and misuse his people. The brother in Highland Park with the Board of Education, Kwame Kirkpatrick and his father. The brother over the library, now I'm hurt. Me and Brother Omar was at a library. Libraries are close to me. The brother over the library, closing library branches, and he getting paid under the table by vendors. Did y'all hear about that? Yeah. Here in Detroit. Yeah. Here in Detroit. News guys, water guys, they got one pension brother, two lawyers, just a pen, right there, and a brother. 
They just said in free press a few months ago, the brother going to jail, but the white guy not. And they both was taking money under the table, but because the white guy rushed in and cooperated, he not getting no time, but he got just as much money as the brother. That's Detroit. That's, that's here. Don't go to the police department. I saw he found you wallowing in your own blood. So we go on, socially confused, socially corrupt, and without the spirit of social community life, as God wrote them to have in their bodies and in their people. So they were lost from their sacred call or their social calling as a people and as a community. And Allah had to lead them back to their true nativity so that they can follow their true lifeline and become a great people as God wanted them to be. This is how Frederick Douglass found us. What is the importance of Frederick Douglass? What is the importance of all those other leaders? They are a sign that the intellect lives. That no, one, no, no matter what you've done to us, the intellect survives. Benjamin Banneker, Sir Dunn of Truth, Frederick Douglass are a sign that the intellect that you try to destroy lives. And they were leading us out of that corruption. And for us to go back, Frederick Douglass said, are we retrogressive? We have more lawyers, more black newspapers, more people in elected position, but are we progressive in the manner that we should be as a people? No, we're, we're retrogressive. We can say that God found us after, after slavery, while we in our own blood, and we had to have Frederick Douglass and others to stand up out of that blood as men, as a man in the mold that God wanted us to be, to lead us, to lead us. <clears throat> Dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to close. You want me to be done? Yeah. I'm going to close. But before I close, I want to tell you uh, what I've been studying. I already shared with you that tape. Make sure you get it from Mother, uh, the mo Daughters and Mothers, 1977. It's in the Muslim Journal. Just make sure you get it. I've served, I've Say just I just uh, went over a little bit with you. The other thing that I'm studying is a book by E. Franklin, e. Franklin Frazier, the black woman in front of me. Uh, read, make sure you read that book now. Then that book led me to a book by Imam Wardi Muhammad called As the East, As the Sun Shining from the East. So said the company. Remember that book? Yeah. In there he has a chapter on slavery and the aftershocks of slavery. And Imam Muhammad asked us to study the impact that slavery has had on our life today. He said, don't expect that whites are going to, psychologists are going to go out there and study that and say, well, or if we're blacks are just, they're going to solve your problem. He said, you have to do it. And he said, when you study your situation, he said, write textbooks. That's what he said, write textbooks. You need to write textbooks. Some of your people still, they think that they are inferior, then you have to scientifically show them that they're not in fear by showing the scientific reasons for them having happy hair, or black skin, or wide nostrils. It's not that they're ugly, but it's scientifically something that happens. You know most black people still say they have to go to the beauty shop? But white people say, I'm going to get my hair cut. You got to be made beautiful, everybody was beautiful before you went there. You like, they say you're not great until you have a PhD, and you're great before you got a PhD, you know? All of that. So that led me to that. And I'll close. Uh, I pray that Allah will forgive us our false and grant us the blessings of faith. We wish the peace and blessings be upon the coming upon the righteous servants all of them. It is indeed an honor to be here with you today. And we look forward to being with you again. Unite us, give us strength. It's not hopeless. In fact, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for us today. And may Allah unite us, a creature with peace, pass along my lips.
and respectful women and women trying to help us become brothers and sisters. Before I close, or before we close, we have a concept we'd like to share with you a plan for our recipe or share with us. Some of you who uh, listen to the lifeline and hear uh, Ilan Rasu share this concept of remembering the man from the human heart. And so I'd like to bring you now Dean uh, uh, for to share that with us. It goes like this, the clear voice of the Khalasan in the world. I've told you about my philosophical mind, my mystical side, and I see myself tomorrow living in you. I won't be dead, I will be living in you. So please give me a nice future. Yes, give me the future you know I want because I won't be living after I die on this earth. I won't be living anywhere except in you. So please, give your Imam, W.D. Muhammad, a nice future. You won't be able to talk to him, but he will be with you living in your time too. So please remember me that I am with you. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Uh, I believe old brother Omar wanted to share last step about the first church in Chicago. Okay. Same day is next week in Chicago. So I have some information on that. Sorry. You know uh, you know a man by his works and his influence. And we know a man war and Dean Muhammad. More by what he has produced uh, with his words. Uh, he, he, he informed us, he changed, he changed, he gave us a day of observation called Savior's Day. We know that Savior's Day in the past was about Quran um, Muhammad. We met Muhammad came and he corrected our knowledge and our understanding, and let them know that. We're talking about those men and women who made the great sacrifices that allows us to be here today. Men and women who were beat down, shot up, knocked up, so that we would be here today. We want to honor those pioneers, and this is what the Savior's Day is about. 